The Seraphan were saviors, defending Nosgoth from the corruption that we represent. My eyes are opened, Cain. I find no nobility in the unlife you rudely forced on my unwilling corpse. You may have uncovered your past, but you know nothing of it. You think the Seraphan were noble? Altruistic? <laughs> Don't be simple. Their agenda was the same as ours. Thousands of years before the Seraphan began their crusade, in a time before Norsgoth's recorded history, vampires freely roamed the land. These ancient winged beings had defeated their adversaries the Hilden and banished them to another dimension. To ensure they could not return, they raised the pillars of Norsgoth to seal the passages between realms, which would remain shut for as long as the pillars stood. With their final act, the Hilden cursed the ancient vampires with sterility and bloodlust. But it was the last part of the curse which truly spelt disaster for the vampires, for they had been condemned with immortality. They were insusceptible to old age, which meant their bodies would never wither and die from natural causes. The repercussions of the curse were felt almost instantly, as the vampire's god fell silent. Disgusted by their immortal bodies, it shunned and turned its back on them. For the first time in their existence, the newly immortal vampires were left without the guidance of God. Many went mad with misery and despair. Some went as far as to take their own lives, so that they may return to their god's wheel of fate. However, there were those who chose to carry on, having begrudgingly accepted the curse of everlasting life. These ancients were governed by the original guardians of the pillars. But even these beings would meet their end. It is not known what led to the demise of the pillars' vampire guardians. Perhaps they had eventually given in to despair like the others. What's clear is that one after another, they fell, their bodies entombed in the citadel of the apostates. Since vampires no longer gave birth, the pillars were forced to appoint new guardians from the human populace to replace the old. This led to further anguish among the ancients, who could feel their once prosperous society slowly slipping away. Realising the pillars had to remain under their control, the ancients devised a means of passing the curse on to humans. Their plan involved abducting and turning the human-born guardians into a new breed of vampires. For a time, their method worked, but inevitably the humans rebelled. In the end, Mortanius the Death Guardian and Mobius the Time Streamer opposed this ritual forced upon them. They rejected the curse and led a revolt against their vampiric masters, claiming the pillars for themselves and for humanity. The winged beings and their successors were persecuted, driven to the very corners of Nosgoth. With their society collapsing and most of their race cast out, their history faded into myth. Out of self-preservation, the remaining vampires retreated from the world. The age of the ancients was coming to an end, and the age of man had begun. However, at least one of the ancients survived. Sustained by his faith to one day see the pillars returned to vampire guardianship, this ancient, Janos Audrin, had sired an entire bloodline of new human-turned-vampires, and his lineage was not so fragile. Over the course of several millennia, the vampire population in Nosgoth grew to an unprecedented amount, enough to capture the attention of the Circle of Nine. Fearing this rise in vampire numbers, and deeming them a threat to their power, the Circle established an order of holy knights to eliminate the Scourge. Thus, the Seraphine Order was brought into the fold. Much more than a civilian army, the Seraphine warrior priests were a formidable force to be reckoned with. Amongst Vorador's possessions, I found an ancient chronicle. Long ago, vampires grew in such number so as to capture the attention of the Circle. The Order of the Seraphan, or the Angels of Light as they were called, was instated to counter the menace. Thus, the Vampire Purge began. Hidden amidst the many obscure artifacts in that museum, I discovered an ancient chronicle. This passage caught my eye. It was during these dark times, infested with the plague of the undead, that the Circle brought the Seraphan to existence. Trained to be devoutly loyal to the Circle and the perfect exterminators of the undead Scourge, they were led to many victories by the righteous Paladin, Malik, they cleansed the vampires with fire, and released their souls to more blessed realms. 
there is no wrath as terrible as that of the righteous. Having been afflicted with an insatiable blood thirst, the vampires relied on humans to feed. They became predators of mankind. There may be other long-standing resentments, but the increase of vampires at the expense of human life was the catalyst which led to the Seraphans' creation. In wanting to protect and preserve humanity, the order appears to have sprouted from noble aspirations. However, any good intentions the order may have had were not to last, as they became glorified and revered as holy icons for carrying out cold-blooded acts of violence. During their crusade, the Seraphan adopted angelic symbolism. Within the stronghold, stained glass windows depicted Seraphan soldiers bearing angel wings, and the Inquisitor's armour are etched with feathers. This angelic imagery appears to be related to the Seraphan's alternate title, the Angels of the Light. Interestingly, the names of the seven Seraphan commanders are derived from fallen angels in various religious texts. In Arabic, Malik means king or chieftain, which is fitting given that the highest ranking member of the Seraphim Brotherhood is named Malik. In Islamic mythology, Malik is a guardian angel of hell. While it's unclear whether the developers of Blood Omen intended for the Seraphim leader to be named after this angel, the names of Malik's six junior inquisitors were most certainly taken from religious figures in biblical mythology. What's also intriguing about the glasswork featuring the winged Seraphan is that they bear some resemblance to the murals of the ancient vampire race. After the initial human insurrection, there was in all likelihood a concerted effort to purge any evidence of ancient civilization. By the time of the Seraphan era, the human populace is almost completely ignorant of the vampire citadel, the Hilden race and the ancient vampire Hilden war. This history is not common knowledge among the peasantry who believe the vampires to be nothing more than devils, which suggests these old accounts were suppressed by Mobius, acting under orders from the Elder God. The span of time between these two eras might have also been a factor. As thousands of years of history became forgotten, the humans lost sight of the ancients' role as defenders of Nosgoth, wholly ignorant of the evils their pillars were holding back. The Circle, and by extension the Seraphan, have supplanted the vampire's role as the world's guardians. Indeed, one might even go as far as to say the Angels of the Light have overthrown the Angels of the Dark. The series doesn't go into detail about the official religion of the Seraphan, so we can only speculate as to what doctrine was used as the basis of their belief system. Nonetheless, the games do drop several hints. In the Oracle's Cave, the fledgling Cain discovers a book detailing the genesis of the Seraphan Order, in which there's that line about the Seraphan cleansing the vampires with fire and releasing their souls to more blessed realms. This suggests that the Order's ideology may have derived from the Elder God's revulsion at immortality and its desire to return all souls to the Wheel of Fate. In Defiance, it's revealed Mobius was introduced to the Elder when he lived among the vampires of the Citadel, the Elder God spoke to him after it stopped preaching to the ancients. It manipulated a young and bitter Mobius, cultivating his hatred towards vampire kind and orchestrating the human revolt. It's not hard to imagine it imparting many over-embellished accounts to Mobius of its divinity, stature and power, while denouncing the vampires as parasites. Vampires are an abomination, a plague which leeches this land of its spiritual strength. They obstruct the flow of life and death. Their souls stagnate in their wretched corpses. But the wheel must turn. Death is inexorable and cannot be denied. It's important to acknowledge that in this age, the Circle of Nine are essentially the spiritual leaders of Nosgoth. They have been gifted with magical powers few mortals possess. As such, it wouldn't take much effort to persuade the Seraphan that their crusade is a righteous one, especially given the bloodthirsty nature of their enemy. It also wouldn't surprise me if many of the Seraphan members were motivated by religious salvation, just as the real-life Knights Templar were during the medieval crusades. With the Circle's promises of deliverance, the Seraphan would not hesitate to perform unspeakable acts of cruelty. I have no doubt they held firmly to the belief that their souls would be sanctified 
and rewarded in the afterlife for their service to the circle. For much of their history, the Seraphim were led by Malik, who was one of the nine. As the guardian of the Pillar of Conflict, Malik's lifelong duty entailed presiding over the principles of change and upheaval. He drew energy from battle, and his purpose was to incite and resolve conflict. He was the perfect candidate to lead the Seraphim into battle. An exemplary warrior, Malik trained his troops in the art of war. He taught them discipline and how to kill with ruthless proficiency. Although his preferred weapon of choice was a long-bladed pike, a statue of the man depicts him wielding a sword and a shield. This implies he was a master of various weapon classes. During his tenure as leader of the order, Malik proved himself a capable commander, assembling his forces into swordsmen and pikemen. The swordsmen were the close quarters fighters of the Seraphan. Though lacking the range of their pikemen allies, they were deadly and excelled at powerful thrusts and slashes. Seraphan pikemen, on the other hand, were the mid-range fighters. They wielded two-handed tridents, with which they attacked with a ferocious series of jabs and sweeping strikes. Not only were they quick and resilient, they also picked up many of their leaders' defensive skills, learning how to block sustained attacks before countering with outstanding swiftness as Malik had taught them. In addition to these soldiers, Seraphim regiments were sometimes accompanied by a spell-casting sorceress, who would shoot fireballs from a distance, effectively covering all rangers in combat. Most of the regular Seraphim knights were adorned with gold-trimmed armour, and their weapons carried the order's symbol. Notably, the hilt of the sword and the trident's prongs had been shaped to resemble the symbol of the Seraphim. The symbol also appeared on numerous banners, and was inscribed on walls and floors in the stronghold. An interesting tidbit about the Seraphim symbol is that it bears a striking similarity to the sculpture atop the Niagara Mohawk building in Syracuse, New York. The sculpture appears to have been used as inspiration for its design. The winged sculpture is dubbed the Spirit of Light, which was meant to convey optimism and progress during the Great Depression when it was built. Perhaps the developers liked the sculpture and wanted to include it in some form in their series. Or maybe they thought the message associated with it reflected the Order's original purpose. After all, the Seraphim Brotherhood initially represented hope to the ordinary citizens of Nosgoth, a beacon of light in the darkness standing against the Vampire Plague. In the time of Vorador, centuries before Cain was made, the Seraphim warrior priests waged a merciless war against the vampire tribes of Nosgoth. Emboldened by righteousness, they committed unspeakable and indiscriminate acts of violence, massacring fledglings and ancients alike. They decimated entire bloodlines in mere decades. Now their husks lay here, murderers enshrined. Take heed, Raziel. A forgotten history lies within. Know thyself, though it may destroy you. As I pulled the stone free, a sigh of sepulchral air escaped the inner chamber. I was not prepared for what lay beyond this threshold. These crypts, defiled caskets of seraphim saints, bearing my brother's names and my own. The irony of Cain's blasphemous act rushed in on me with the crushing force of revelation. Were my hands not as bloody as these? Worse, I had spilled the blood of my brothers, these very comrades whose tombs lay ravaged before me. With Malik presiding over the deaths of thousands of vampires, the Order would enter into something of a golden era. Of course, Malik wasn't alone in leading the Seraphim Crusades. Sometime around when the Order was first established, a very special child was born. This child was christened Raziel, and was likely accepted into the Order at a young age. 
Although we know next to nothing about Raziel's upbringing, one could assume he was indoctrinated early on in his life to hate vampires. His contempt for the vampire race was nurtured by the Seraphan, and it's believed Raziel relied on his steadfast beliefs and fanaticism to sharpen his skills and channel his hatred towards the enemy. Raziel's unfaltering devotion to the Seraphan's ideals, together with his barbarity, gained the attention of Malik and the other members of the Circle. The young but ambitious man rose quickly through the ranks, claiming a position of power as Head Inquisitor of the Order. He was senior to Tyrell and the other commanders, but subordinate to Malik. Within the upper tower of the Seraphan stronghold, there is a chamber overlooking the pillars. This chamber has seven thrones, which clearly belong to the seven commanders of the Order, being Malik, Raziel, Turel, Duma, Rahab, Zephon, and Melchiah. I believe it was here the commanders collaborated, coming up with battle plans and strategies on how to best combat the vampire threat. Here they plotted the murder of Janos Audrin, the last of the Ancients. Reaching Janos would prove difficult though, as his retreat's balconies were inaccessible to those lacking the gift of flight. However, Mobius counseled the commanders to be on the lookout for the arrival of a blue demon who would open the way through the fortress. By following this creature, Mobius promised the Seraphim would be able to infiltrate the lair of the infamous Janos Audrin with ease. Before they departed on their journey north, Mobius lent his staff to Tyrell, presumably instructing the Seraphim to use the staff to subdue the Ancient. After confronting Janos, the clash ended with the human Raziel gouging out the old vampire's heart. Looking back on the series, I've often wondered whether Raziel and his Seraphim brethren were related by blood. Many times throughout the games, Raziel has referred to them as his brothers in dialogue. What complicates the matter is that Cain raised Raziel and his fellow commanders from the dead as his favoured sons. Following their resurrection, they were in essence vampire siblings, as they each shared a piece of Cain's soul inside of them. It's similar to how Janos was considered the father of the human-turned-vampires in his day, as their curse originated from him. Given the commanders look quite different, Melchiah and Zephon especially, I'm inclined to believe they are more akin to brothers-in-arms, rather than being blood-related. Raziel also didn't appear upset upon learning that his future self had murdered his comrades. In fact, he seemed to be quite nonchalant about it, so, vampire, here we are. You've destroyed my brethren, and now you've come for me. You'll find I'm not such easy prey. I quite enjoy these scenes between the two Raziels in Soul Reaver 2. I particularly like how it illustrates one's ideology can completely change given enough time and self-reflection. In the series, Raziel experiences a kind of amnesiac dissonance. In fact, it happens to him twice. When he first discovers that in life, he was a Seraphim vampire hunter, he embraces his former humanity and begins to aspire to that legacy, despite now being a wraith. Strange how my history came full circle. This chapel, I realized, was a memorial to my former Seraphim brethren and myself. All of us martyred here, and then so cruelly profaned by Cain when he imposed his gift on our noble corpses. For the first time, I beheld the image of my Seraphan self, memorialized here among my fallen comrades. It tortured me to see how noble and pure I had been, and what a vile phantasm I had become and a profound sense of injury, of loss and betrayal, welled up in me, so overwhelming I could barely contain it. All I wanted at this moment was to find Cain and destroy him. During this scene, Raziel sees a heroic statue memorializing his Seraphan self, and assumes he was a man of virtue. At this moment, he wishes to live up to that ideal, but later, upon travelling into the past, he sees the Seraphim were far more monstrous than the vampires they hunted. They weren't the benevolent champions of the downtrodden he believed them to be. Instead, they were shown to be overconfident zealots, 
who mask their mass bloodshed beneath a veil of self-righteousness. And to make matters worse, the human Raziel was one of the most repugnant offenders. Here at last, in the flesh, I beheld my former brothers in arms, the warrior priests of the Sarafan Order, their lives devoted solely to the annihilation of the Vampire Plague. And while I confess, I felt a twinge of longing, a pang of grief for what I had believed was my lost virtue, I regarded them now with none of the reverence I formerly felt. For I had seen the human face of the vampires, and now I beheld the monstrousness of these men. In the aftermath of their greatest victory, the Seraphim would suffer their worst defeat, as the murder of Janos Audrin provoked the wrath of two of Nosgoth's most powerful inhabitants, the Wraith Raziel and the Vampire Vorador, who launched simultaneous assaults on the Stronghold. These attacks at the very heart of the Seraphim's power had terrible ramifications for the Order, as it led to the deaths of six of its commanders, as well as several members of the Circle. The Seraphim were dealt a devastating blow, having suffered a huge loss of their leadership, as well as the Circle's sponsorship. Most costly for the Order though, was arguably the fate of Malak himself, who was punished for his failure. Placing all the blame of the Circle's deaths on Malak, the Death Guardian Mortanius ripped out the Paladin's soul and imprisoned it in his suit of armour. Deprived of the pleasures of the flesh, the once proud warrior was left disgraced and humiliated. The Order would never fully recover from this series of events. While they limped on for several years under Mobius' guidance, corruption had already taken root. As detailed in the official strategy guide for Legacy of Cain Defiance, there was a slow degradation of the soldiers' personal and public morals. The Seraphim started to hoard riches inside their religious sanctuaries and flaunted their wealth by adorning their armour with jewels and gold. Just outside their walls, the workers and peasants were left to struggle against poverty, which was worsened by the Seraphim's own heavy-handed taxation. With the loss of public support, membership dwindled until the order could no longer sustain itself. And so, as numbers stagnated, Nosgoth's greatest militant order finally met its end. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to support the channel, please leave a like, or consider subscribing if you're new here. Your help goes a long way and is always appreciated. Also, feel free to share your thoughts on the Seraphim Brotherhood in the comments below. Cheers.